He told them, O oh, people of Israel, worship one God, your Lord and my Lord. Thank you very much for listening. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Okay. Um, appreciate the first presentation by Brother Adnan. Um, he went over slightly um, to half an hour, so we'll give Sarah half an hour uh, for her presentation. Um, and then after there on, we'll have to be a bit more tight with the time restrictions as uh, you know, time permits, we can't go on as we would like to, but without further ado, I'll give uh, Sarah the mic for her presentation. Thank you, and uh, thank you for having me. It's a privilege to be here. Um, may God bless the words of my mouth as I speak. Um, first of all, I want to just uh, say that I, I do want to speak today uh, primarily, or first and foremost, as a Christian um, rather than as an academic theologian. Uh, that's why I'm here, I believe. So I'm going to be sharing with you my understanding of Jesus from a Christian perspective. Oh, all right, okay. okay. Yep, that's fine. Um, one, one, is that better? No, no, that's fine. We can. One question uh, that I just do have in response um, to uh, my colleague's uh, presentation there, and one that actually I'm not going to address today, but I'll explain why, um, is, of course, the issue of uh, the Bible as a corrupt book, a corrupt scripture. Um, and, and a question that I've often had, and I've still not heard a good answer to, so I'd love to ask this now before I forget, um, is why it is that God in the Quran talks about the previous scripture and encourages uh, the believers to talk with the people of the book uh, because that was given at a time much later uh, when the scripture was there. Certainly the Jewish scriptures were there as a full um, testament, if you like, and uh, the Christian scriptures were circulating too. So that's, that's a question I'd love to ask um, for later on. Meanwhile, um, I... Um, not here to prove Jesus' identity, because I believe, as all of you do, I'm sure only God can do that. Um, but I do want to encourage you to ask questions about him. Uh, what kind of prophet was he? What did he come to do? What did he ask of his followers? On whose authority did he teach? On whose authority did he perform miracles? How is the Injil mentioned in the Quran relevant? Can the four Gospels about Jesus' life found in the Bible be trusted? And we've looked at that uh, a little. Does their portrayal of Jesus agree with the Quranic one? These are all uh, vital questions, but for today, I'm going to assume that the Gospels and the Bible are a reliable source about Jesus. Uh, they have been accepted as such by the Christian community ever since they were written and assembled. Um, one thing that uh, Christians do believe is that the way in which the um, books of the New Testament were written and subsequently assembled by the uh, church leaders uh, was constantly in the, um, uh, under the guidance of God, that God, through his Holy Spirit, was guiding those decisions being made. So it's not simply that there were lots of books out there and only some of them ended up in the Bible. It's that God was continually guiding those people who were making those decisions. So that's a very strong Christian belief. Um, today's primary question is, who was Jesus? To many folks here in Britain, Jesus is just a swear word, but for both Christians and Muslims, he is clearly far more than that. Firstly, who was he not? Uh, he was not God's son in the physical sense of God having had sexual relations with Mary. Christians would be just as appalled at that idea as Muslims. Christians think of Jesus as the son of God, but not in the physical sense of a son, the word walad, perhaps, in Arabic. Instead, it's more the word ibn. It's referring to the relationship between God and Jesus. When God condemns the idea of him having sons or daughters in the Quran, I believe he's referring to pagan beliefs in which the gods often had children together. Likewise, elsewhere in the Quran, he confirms that he is not three, God, Jesus, and Mary. That was a common misunderstanding at the time of the prophet. The Byzantine church appeared to hold Mary in such high regard that she was almost, or possibly was, worshipped. God swiftly condemns such views. Christianity, like Judaism and Islam, affirms absolutely the idea of one God. The confusion arises over the three ways in which Christians understand the one God. Yet God is able to communicate himself physically within this world as a book, for example, the Arabic Quran. So why not as a human being? If God can speak his word through the pages of a book, why not through the mouth of a man? Neither of these methods needs compromise God's oneness. 
He is and always will be one God. At the start of John's Gospel, written about 60 years after Jesus, he does not describe Jesus as created in Mary's womb at a particular moment in time. Instead, he describes Jesus as God's word, who has always been with God throughout all time and beyond. This is what he writes. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only. That was written by John in his gospel. John does not think of Jesus, it seems, as a creature created by God. Rather, he describes him as the very word of God, i.e. as the revelation of God. Hence, when he becomes flesh, i.e. human, he continues to reveal the heart and mind of God. As a Christian, I believe that Jesus was a prophet in that he was sent by God with a message for humans. But I also believe he was more than a prophet. During the three years of his public ministry, Jesus' companions, his disciples, were also asking themselves all the time, who is he? Jesus' disciples were Jewish, and we've heard about the importance of understanding the Jewishness of Jesus, and I thoroughly um, agree with that. Uh, Their understanding of God was actually similar to Muslim ideas about God, that God is absolutely one. In that sense, the disciples' views about God are very similar to some of the views that you will have here today. At first, therefore, they viewed Jesus primarily as a religious teacher, a rabbi. But as they spent time with him, hearing his teaching, witnessing his miracles, and learning from what he said about himself, they began to ask, who is he really? I'm going to look at a couple of the reasons for that. Jesus taught primarily about the kingdom of God, the day when God's rule will reign over all the earth. In preparation for this day, Jesus encouraged the people to repent of their sins and turn back to God. For example, in Mark's Gospel, uh, chapter 1, verse 15. Jesus' miracles particularly made the disciples wonder about his identity. For example, on Lake Galilee, in a wild storm, Jesus commanded the winds to stop, and they did. The disciples said, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Jesus miraculously fed a crowd of 5,000 when there was no food. That's a miracle also recorded in the Quran. He healed the blind, the deaf, and the lame, and he raised people from the dead. The Quran also refers to some of these miracles. And we ask, how can Jesus perform miracles? The Quran's answer in Surah 5, verse 110, is that it's by God's permission. Possibly the disciples would have thought something similar. They watched Jesus do things that only God the Creator can do. So they asked, how is this man related to God, Creator of the universe? Jesus also forgave sins. For example, when he healed a paralyzed man. This man's friends were so convinced that Jesus could heal him that they made a hole in the roof of the crowded house where Jesus was teaching and passed him down. Jesus said to the man, Son, your sins are forgiven. The Jewish leaders were shocked, of course, and thought, Why does this man talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? No doubt the disciples too would have thought something similar. Jesus taught by his own authority, not by referencing traditional authorities like the great rabbis. So instead of saying, Rabbi so-and-so said, Jesus would often say, truly, I say to you. In fact, his well-known Sermon on the Mount, Jesus first quoted uh, Jewish scripture or traditions. He'd say, you have heard that such and such is said. And then he would say, but I say to you this. So on whose authority was Jesus teaching? Jesus claimed that one day he will judge the world. For example, in his parable of the sheep and the goats, he said, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another. On what basis could Jesus ever act as judge on the final day? And if Jesus thought of himself as God, why did he never say so? The titles Jesus used for himself were all taken from the Jewish scriptures. His favorite, for example, was Son of Man. In some verses of the Jewish scripture, which is the Christian Old Testament, uh, this term emphasizes humanity, and Jesus would have been aware of this when he used the term. 
There is also a significant passage in the uh, Old Testament about the dream of a prophet named Daniel. And this is what it said. This is from the Jewish scriptures. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence, that's God. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. That's from the book of Daniel, chapter 7. So this son of man is clearly a human being, and yet he was also accepted right into God's presence, given authority and power, and then worshipped by people of every nation. That would have seemed immensely strange to the Jews, and yet there it is in their scripture. Jesus also described himself as God's son. He always spoke to and of God as his father and described himself as the son. For example, he told his disciples, all things have been committed to me by my, by my father. No one knows the son except the father, and no one knows the father except the son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. The title, Son of God, is actually a Jewish title from the Jewish scripture, in which it is often used to refer to the Jewish people, whom God calls Israel. For example, when God tells Moses what to say to Pharaoh, he says, This is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son. Let my son go, so that he may worship me. That's from Exodus 4. Another example is when God spoke through the prophet Hosea, saying, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Son of God is also a title in the Jewish scriptures for their king, who was chosen by God as his representative on earth. In the Psalms, for example, King David writes, I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have become your father. In the Gospels, God also calls Jesus my son on two very important occasions. Both times, the language used is the same as that used in the Jewish scriptures to refer to King David. For example, when Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan, God's voice spoke from heaven saying, You are my son whom I love. And when Jesus met with God at the top of a mountain with his two closest disciples at the Transfiguration, God said again, this is my son whom I love. Jews would mostly have understood this phrase in the scriptural sense as one specially chosen by God to be his representative on earth, a little like another King David. So just to sum up briefly, Jesus does things only God can do, like raising the dead and other miracles. Jesus claims to do things that in Jewish minds only God can do, for example, forgive sins and judge the world. Yet Jesus never says directly, I am God. Instead, he uses titles for himself that are all drawn from the Jewish scriptures. The disciples must have been confused. They knew Jesus was a human because they were living, sleeping, and eating with him 24 hours a day. But he seemed to be acting on behalf of God, and furthermore, seemed to have an intensely close relationship with God. So how did all this change the way the disciples thought of Jesus? When Jesus and his disciples were on Mount Hermon in Caesarea Philippi, Jesus asked them, who do people say I am? The disciples replied, some say John the Baptist, a prophet, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. Then Jesus asked, what about you? Who do you say I am? And Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Messiah. So what did Peter mean? The Quran also describes Jesus as the Messiah. For example, when the angel announces the birth of Jesus to Mary, O Mary, Allah bids you rejoice in a word from him whose name is the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary. He shall be prominent in this world and the next and shall be near to God. That's Surah 3. But to understand its use in the Gospels, we first need to understand what the title Messiah or Christ meant to the Jews. In the Jewish scriptures, kings and priests were anointed with oil as a public sign that they were set apart for their special work. They were appointed and commissioned by God. In time, the Jews spoke about a hope that one day God himself would intervene in the history of his people by sending a Messiah who would be a descendant of King David. This Messiah would finally establish God's kingdom on earth. <laughs> 
So when Peter called Jesus the Messiah, he would have had this concept in mind. He thought of Jesus as the descendant of David, chosen by God to establish his kingdom on earth. Why didn't Jesus ever call himself the Messiah or the Christ? Perhaps because the Jewish leaders of his time had developed a wrong understanding of Messiah as a political or a military leader, and Jesus' understanding of his own role was definitely not that. When Jesus was eventually arrested by the Jewish leaders and brought to trial before the chief priests, he was asked, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? And what did Jesus reply? I am, which by the way, it's a name God gives himself at the burning bush when Moses asks who he is. But at his trial, Jesus immediately continues by describing himself as the son of man in very similar terms to that dream of Daniel I described earlier. He was not claiming to be some kind of replacement God. He still affirmed the absolute oneness of the almighty God. So again, how did the disciples' understanding of Jesus change? When Jesus was crucified, the disciples were devastated and confused. How could God allow his appointed representative on earth to suffer such a shameful death? But then they saw the empty tomb and soon after met face to face with Jesus again, this time risen from the dead. They began to realize this was God's way of vindicating Jesus and affirming him as someone utterly unique. So take the disciple Thomas, for example. He was the one who most doubted that Jesus could be alive again after having seen the empty tomb. So what did Thomas say when Jesus stood before him and allowed him to touch the holes in his hands from where he'd been nailed to the cross? He said, my Lord and my God. So how did the disciples change in their thinking? Remember, their outlook is entirely Jewish. So perhaps they thought something like this. If Jesus is the one through whom God is establishing his kingdom on earth, Jesus must have the authority of a king like King David in order to be God's representative on earth. Jesus always referred to God as his father and spoke of himself as his son. He had an intimately close relationship with God. Jesus was able to calm storms, heal the sick and raise people from the dead. These are miracles only God can do. Jesus forgave sins and claimed that one day he would judge the world, which made him somehow more than a prophet. Jesus was fully human, and yet he did things that only God can do. The disciples never rejected their belief in the oneness of God, and yet as eyewitnesses, they realized that Jesus had a very close connection with God. By the time the Gospels are written, within decades of Jesus returning to heaven, the disciples and the other early Christians have realized that God's oneness is not necessarily compromised by the idea that he is also physically present in this world. And that's really important, that his oneness is not compromised by the fact that he can be physically present in this world. Just seven weeks after Jesus came back from the dead, the disciples experienced the arrival of God's Holy Spirit to enable them to continue the ministry Jesus has begun. Uh, that was, is recorded in Acts chapter 2. They too were then able to perform miracles and teach in God's name. In some way then, God remains one and yet his spirit moves in the world. The disciples and the growing Christian community began to realize the close connection between God the Father, Jesus the Son, and God's Holy Spirit. All are one God and yet all function in differing ways. God's oneness is not compromised in any way. The greatest challenge to the early Christians came from Arius, or Arius, an Egyptian priest who taught that Jesus was not the eternal son of God, but was actually created by God in Mary's womb. The church subsequently rejected very strongly this claim at their various councils, particularly the Council of Nicaea and, and at uh, Charles Sidon, but there are others um, too. This was when the church clarified the Christian view of Jesus as both fully human and fully div divine. By this point, the church was having to define itself within non-Jewish contexts, in particular in a world of pagans and Greek philosophy. Although some of the words developed by the church, like Trinity, for example, Trinitas in Latin, were not used by the disciples, they did not actually represent anything new, I believe. It was just that they were trying to formulate difficult concepts in, uh, in a different milieu. So Jesus, as son of God, refers not to his origin in Mary's womb, and certainly not to the product of a sexual union between God and Mary. Rather, it refers to the relationship Jesus had with his father. 
So I would actually encourage you to read a gospel to find out more about Jesus. Note how many times the Jewish scriptures are referenced. And remember all the time you read that Jesus moved in Jewish circles. His disciples and all those he interacted with had an orthodox understanding of God that was and is very similar to the Islamic view, firmly and squarely monotheistic. And yet they came to realize that Jesus was more than a prophet. John's Gospel says, No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. In writing this, John shows that he believes God, the unseen, eternal, almighty God, has revealed himself and made himself known to us as Jesus. For me, as a Christian, Jesus is the clearest possible revelation of God we could ever have. A revelation not as a book, but as a human being like us. His character, his life, his death, and his resurrection all reveal the character of God and communicate to us how we should respond. So Jesus did not just bring a message like other prophets. He actually was the message. And what was this message? It's one that reconciles human beings with God. God will judge us one day, and Jesus came to show us how to be those who are saved, not those who are condemned. And then I'll end actually with something else that John wrote um, in his gospel that you will all have heard many times, uh, probably quoted at you by Christians, but it is relevant and very important in this context. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God sent the Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And that's from John chapter 3, verse 16.